Thank you very much. Um, I'd like uh, to open the floor for questions. Uh, I'd like to start with Ms. Seattle GSE. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. When, when you're looking uh, in a port, usually the, 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 the speed of loading, unloading containers is an essence. They should move lots of stock containers and, and other uh, material. And usually it's, it's mechanical, I suppose, and it's anchored, and, uh, and after it's unhooked automatically or, or by and uh, Is this type of accident frequent to your knowledge in the, in the, in the ports? Because they, they handle thousands and thousands and thousands of, of uh, containers. So I, I expect it was not necessarily the first, or may, I hope it's the last. Uh, André Regimbal here. To our knowledge, this is the first incident that has been reported to the CNSC. But perhaps uh, if I can ask uh, the person from RSB Logistic to provide information about uh, the number uh, of such operations uh, in the port. Mr. Eck, over to you. George Eckel, RSB. Uh, we are told that it happens approximately once every 200,000 container moves, is the information we've been told at this time. From whom? Who told you? The, where is this information coming from? This is information directly from the Port of Halifax. So when you say, I don't know how many containers the, the Halifax port is handling, but if it's every 200,000, that means the, there is, I suppose they handle more than 200,000. So it's several times a year it happens. Uh, do you have, uh, independently on what was in this incident, accident involved, it was hexafluoride, but for other material, do you have any any uh, maintenance, inspections, tests, and the frequency of uh, uh, procedure revisions? I'm sorry, could you clarify the question? I guess we have regular maintenance, inspections, recertifications for our owned equipment, the flat rack, but as far as the, the port equipment, no, we do not. Okay, uh, they, it was mainly uh, mainly for port facilities because that's their equipment it's not yours yes that's correct and you to your knowledge you don't know what's the procedures and uh, what's the frequency of maintenance of this uh, uh, equipment we've asked for the maintenance records and service records of the equipment and are still waiting for that okay uh, when you look, it's a, uh, does the cargo hold con uh, contain only one or several layers of flat racks? Several layers. Uh, could you tell me what's the maximum lift of container, more specifically flat racks, when loading on unloading? Because here it was a seven meter drop into the vessel cargo hold on the other layer. Uh, is it possible that at one point the potential drop will exceed nine meters as you move it up and you move it to, to the dock uh, uh, and uh, that the potential drop will exceed nine meters, therefore overpass the regulation, the regulation designed drop limit? If I could pass that question to one of my colleagues, Mr. Clausen, uh, as far as the positioning of the containers on the vessel, he could comment on that. At this time, I would not uh, be able to give a, an exact answer on that because uh, that's something I'm not familiar with. I'm not uh, on the terminal. I, I don't know the operations of a terminal and the height that they lift. I have the same question, and uh, but at this time, I don't have an answer. Can I can I uh, piggyback on this? Um, what I'd like to know is whether there are specific 
instruction or regulation on uranium on this particular material that indicate to the port authority thou shall not lift this box above nine meters is there such a regulatory or procedural requirement I will ask Mr. Sylvain Fay to provide information on that. Sylvain Fay, for the record, uh, actually the regulations don't require any, or there's no limitation on the, on the height for the lifting. The regulations were designed for transport purposes, and the 9 meter drop, which is specified in the regulations for those packages, is to simulate a, a road accident at a, a certain speed. But the, the other important part is the target where the, the, uh, the package has to be dropped onto which is defined in the regulations as unyielding surface, which is extremely hard compared to like, road or even concrete. So th there is some compensation there in terms of the drop height is 9 meter as a set uh, level, but the, uh, the surface onto what it has to be dropped onto uh, is much more stronger in the regulation than what is happening in, the, in normal accidents. But to answer the question, there's no limit on the, on the, on the height when it's lifted. It's not nine meter or anything like that. We said that, Jesse. So, uh, because potentially what you are looking here, if it was not a last row, a bottom row of these uh, flat racks, the drop could be higher than nine meters. And when you lift it about the the the, the side of a ship and you move it, I think that it could be even higher. So. Uh, I think we should look that what what will happen if it's we should review this. Uh, the other question is I have: Could you compare the container certification? When you compare, you know, we have, we had a, a large accident in uh, Eastern Townships where the train uh, just blew up, and uh, the question there was. Uh, questioning the the container quality and and uh, and resistance. So, could you compare what's the certification of this hexafluoride containers versus railroad fuel and other liquid containers? Yeah, so, if I for the record, I don't have the exact information on to uh, rail cars or uh, or tanker for other types of dangerous goods, but for the uh, the radioactive material, all the requirements are in the regulation, and like I said, they have to resist accident conditions, which is simulated by the 9-meter drop test that we just mentioned, which is one of the tests, in the, and, and on top of that, they also have to withstand a thermal test for about uh, eight, it's 800 degrees Celsius for half an hour, and there's also immersion test following that. So th there's design requirements in the regulation that each package that requires certification needs to meet before they are approved. And I'm not sure of the design requirements for uh, rail cars or other uh, packages designed for other dangerous goods. I should note also, it's André de Jambel here, that the, uh, the, the UF-6 itself is, is very different from the commodity that was transported uh, involving, uh, involved in the Lac Megantic uh, accident. Um, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Michael Rinker, to provide just an overview of the physical and chemical characteristics uh, of UF6 as it is packaged. Mike Rinker, for the record, um, the Port Hope Conversion Facility makes a very similar product and stores it and, and uh, um, transport it in similar ways. Um, the product, UF6, um, once it cools to uh, normal ambient temperature, is a solid. Um, it's uh, um, it's not flammable on its own. It can, it's an oxidant, so it can make other things burn. Um, but I guess the, one of the major risks for exposure to UF6 would be more of a chemical nature. Even the uranium itself is more of, um, its risk is more of a heavy metal than, uh, than it is from the dose perspective. And uh, if it gets wet, um, then the fluoride can combine with, um, with water and other things and, and be quite corrosive to the yeah. skin. So it's, it's um, it, its risks are associated more of a, of a strong chemical hazard, um, but it is uh, in the form that it's being transported in. It's, it's in a solid form, so if the um, container were to break, it could be cleaned up. Um, if it were to get wet, then it's a little bit more difficult. These cylinders are not under pressure or under 
uh, negative pressure. Uh, Mike Ring, for the record, they're under negative pressure. So, uh, if if an accident happens for any reasons, it could the the the, 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 the containment could blow out. Uh, when I say blow out, I. Uh, Actually, I think it's the opposite. If it was under positive pressure and it breached, it would blow up. Under negative pressure, some it would be the opposite. And uh, these uh, cylinders, what's the life of these cylinders? And what's the life of uh, the overpacks? And how the overpacks are certified also, because we have a certification for these cylinders. But how... Uh, is the overpacks are certified, and when you combine them, because that's when you know uh, when there is a drop, uh, we could see what will happen. Yes, so if I actually the uh, what is certified is the uh, the overpack with the cylinders. That's the package, and that is what is certified under the CNSC. The cylinders themselves also need to be uh, approved under the NC standard which is a, a different one, and that only combines for the looking at the cylinders themselves. But on, on our end, we're looking at both the overpack plus the cylinder, that's the package, and that is the combination that we are certifying. And as part of that, they have regular maintenance on, done on those packages, including the cylinders and the overpack, and that, that is uh, under uh, regular maintenance. Perhaps RB Logistics could provide more information on actually the, uh, the frequency of inspections. And the, uh, so the certification process uh, is, is a, a rigorous uh, technical review of the design uh, of the, the package and the cylinder, and the uh, review is performed by accredited professional engineers at the CNSC uh, who follow uh, the ANSI the review against their ANSI standard and other industry standard and based on expert uh, judgment. Okay, there's going to be another round. Uh, so let's move on to Dr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, can, I, can I just be clear about the sequence? The, um, the accident happened. The first responders would notify the company RSB and the CNSC, or did I hear that you said RSB was notified and then CNSC was notified? So if I, I'm not sure exactly the order, the exact order, but I know the first responders called Canutech, which is the service uh, emergency service from Transport Canada, and RSB Logistics was also con uh, notified. I'm not sure who was notified first on the two, but it was probably very close one to the other. From the CNSC, we were notified through the uh, Transport Canada Canutech service, who have a direct line with our duty officer. So there wouldn't be an expectation for a radioactive package that CNSC would be notified as one of the first notifies, notif people to be notified? Uh, it, it could happen, but normally the first responders are trained when there is a transportation accident uh, to contact Canutech first, and then Canutech would contact us, and this occurs very rapidly. And the time between CNSC being notified and the inspector being on site was how long? Uh, just given my notes, we were notified um, on the evening of Mar well, Sylvain, can you, Martin. Can you uh, okay, excuse me. Martin Terio uh, will provide the exact detail. For the record, uh, Martin Terio, uh, transport officer with CNSC. Uh, we were notified by uh, Kenetech through the duty officer on uh, the Thursday evening at uh, 10 o'clock and uh, was on site at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, the following day uh, I was in Halifax. That seems a long time. The uh, situation was under control through the night. Uh, the first responders uh, established a safe perimeter around the, the, the vessel. Um, at that point, it was difficult to see if there was any leakage from the containers, but the radiation level measured at six meters from the packages indicated that uh, uh, the radiation level was normal. Uh, once we uh, got in on the Friday morning, uh, we organized ourselves to dispatch Mr. Terio to Halifax 
And uh, the first flight that he could hop onto was at 1 p.m., I believe, or, or there uh, around that time from Ottawa. So as soon as he got on site, then he uh, immediately uh, went to the, the port. I still think, Mr. President, that seems a, s a slow response time to get somebody from CNSC on site. I mean, it must have been possible for somebody to get there much sooner than that, flying through Toronto. I mean, there the must be flights in the morning. The, the situation assessed, uh, again, was, uh, was under control at the port. Uh, there was no indication of someone's life was at stake. We, we did our due diligence and obtained exactly the information uh, and started to organize ourselves uh, early on Friday morning. So by the time we organized the, the travel, um, as I said, from Ottawa, the, the, the first flight was at 1 p.m. to Halifax. But um, you know that in the first few hours, there was a bit of um, misinformation that um, we were not sure whether there was a leak or not. Uh, and um, the dose uh, reported or put a, a scare of people because they were talking about four time back one, whatever that meant. So I, I think the question is, um, what would happen if the, how do you know it wasn't at that time something to worry about? Uh, perhaps I can clarify that we were, we were assisting from remotely from Ottawa early on. Okay, so we were providing assistance to, to the people on site who were conducting the, the first response. Um, we would get uh, worried if uh, radiation levels were above what what uh, it would be normal for this type of transport, or if there was a spill, a confirmed uh, spill. And as I said, um, we we are involved early on to assist first responders until we organize ourselves to dispatch physically an inspector um, on the scene. Shawad, Raoul Awad, the Director General of Security and Safeguard. Uh, since uh, we, we, uh, we've been informed at 10 p.m., at 10.15, uh, there was a li direct line with the first responder, what the measurement they took. And uh, at that time, we start assessing what kind of measurement and if needed, uh, immediate support to the first responder. And we contacted Mr. Terrio, and we contacting at the same time our inspectors in, in uh, uh, New Brunswick, in St. Jean. And the choice was either we will uh, send somebody from Saint Jean or from Ottawa, uh, but due to the uh, radiation level, which is very low, and uh, uh, the situation is totally under control, the decision was to ask Mr. Terrio to go the next day instead of sending during the night somebody from uh, uh, Saint Jean. Thank you, Dr. McEwen. Okay, Ms. Welshi. Um, I've, I've heard in the media that there have been uh, similar incidents in the past, maybe one such uh, incident in Halifax and perhaps something a bit more serious in the U.S. Uh, can you provide some more details on that, please? André Jambal here, we're not aware of other similar incidents at the Port of Halifax. Uh, I'll have to examine or review the information that was uh, published in the media, but to our knowledge, uh, this is the first incident of this type that happened in any port in Canada. Okay, so I heard there was something in the 1990s and then in the 1980s in the in the United States that was a little more serious. Uh, but maybe I'll pass uh, on to uh, Mark uh, where I'd heard that, and maybe you can follow up on that. But does RSB aware of uh, any incidents specifically on this type of shipment in the U.S. or anywhere else? George Ackle, for the record, no, I am not aware of any similar incidents with similar cargos. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Um, on uh, slide uh, 24, where you uh, talk about uh, how 
all the things worked. Um, have have there been areas of improvement that you have identified, that things that could have worked better? We've heard uh, about some early miscommunication, and it seems like there is still a bit of public angst about was there a leak, why were the dose rates higher? Um, so if you can uh, maybe shed some light as to, uh, you know, what, what, what are some of the learnings from here, and um, how could things have uh, been better communicated? In particular, uh, we are we have scheduled a lessons learned meeting on April fourth with uh, all those who were involved uh, from the CNSC uh, side, and uh, we will be able to uh, determine at that time what worked and what didn't work and what we can improve. So we can provide further information um, at a later time on that. And, and so will RSB provide uh, uh, a report on this, is that correct? Yes, RSB uh, indicated to us that they would be submitting a report on April the 3rd. Uh, you used new overpacks. Was that just a precautionary measure, or uh, was there some evidence that the existing ones had been damaged? It's an FI for the record. I think it, the, uh, the main reason was to... Uh, also, uh, there was some damage to the overpack, but they were not extensive damage. But the the fact that some had some of the the saddles were torn and things like that was much easier to bring in a new uh, new flat rat with new overpacks and make sure that everything was uh, done. That and also they could verify each cylinder before moving on to their final destination it was as a precaution, uh, precautionary measure. Thank you. Uh, I'll come back for in my second round. Monsieur Hervé? Well, just one question about the, uh, you mentioned that the overpack uh, 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 has to meet the uh, standard, and, uh, uh, but what about the uh, cylinder? I mean, even if the, uh, if the overpack, uh, if we suppose the overpack broke uh, at that time, uh, this is not to say that, that there would be uh, radiation. So the uh, cylinder itself has a certain uh, resistance, I suppose. Yes, if I, that is correct. There are some testing required requirements for those cylinders in the NC standard, including some uh, pressure testing, because they, they also have to meet the, the requirements for when they are being filled in a, a plant or when they are being emptied. So those ones, and they are also, and also the, the 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 standard applies for when the cylinders are being manufactured and ensure that they would be safe to handle in a facility where they have to be lifted also, and as well as uh, filled and emptied. But I can uh, I'll have what to look into well, more uh, details. What could happen with the uh, cylinder if uh, you drop it when trying to uh, to put it in the overpack to insert it in the overpack? If you drop the cylinder. Uh, what could happen? This this is the uh, the loading in the overpack occurs within the facility. Um, Mr. Rinker might have some additional information, or otherwise we would we would get back to you on that. Mike Rinker, for the record, I have to get back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other? Question. Anybody else? Ms. Velshi? Uh, you, you mentioned the first responders get trained. Who, who trains them? Could you repeat the question, please? Who trains the first responders? We train the first responders for emergency uh, nuclear and radiological emergency. And it, we give the training for the first responder all across Canada under the uh, CBRNE program, which is uh, chemical, biological, uh, radiological, and nuclear uh, program. And they would be the ones responsible for measuring dose rates and communicating their uh, findings? That's correct. So that will be part of your review as well, then, on how well that happened. Um, the so, so just to conclude on this question, so are you happy with 
I, I think the first responder was the, the fire authority in the port, if I, if I understand correctly. And th that's, those yeah. are the people we're talking that, about? That's correct, yeah. The hazmat team at, at Right. And Halifax I thought they port. did a, a good job uh, on everything besides communicating with the press. Uh, so, <laughs> are you satisfied that they actually... Actually, they did exactly what we expect them to do. They are the first responder. They are the first to, to be on the scene of that accident, taking measurement and inform the authority. I know, but one, I, I thought one of the first um, um, observation is to assess whether there is safety and risk to the public. And I don't think they've... Um, in fact, everything they've said about uh, the dose and uh, the hazard was uh, not, uh, let's put it this way, um, assuring the public yeah. when they didn't have all the information. Uh, actually, they, they, uh, when they give uh, to the media, they give it as relative to the background radiation, which is not the right way to do it. And, and that's something we need to maybe adjust in our training. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my last question was around uh, port operations. In uh, slide 25, you say it was perfectly safe to work around the packages, uh, and, I, and this determination was made when the inspector went on site this, uh, the next day. Uh, so why did it take the port some a uh, couple more days before it, it uh, resumed operations? Martin Terriot, for the record. Uh, the decision was made by the uh, terminal authority uh, or terminal operator based on the uh, assessment done by the uh, radiation expert that was uh, hired by, uh, by them. So they wanted him to confirm that uh, no level of radiation were uh, detected on the surface of the container. And uh, that's when they had the uh, sufficient uh, insurance that there were no loose contamination on the surface and the container. And also they wanted to safely remove the uh, container from the uh, cargo hold before to resume uh, operation because it was still a small risk of uh, an incident happening because the uh, cylinder were not uh, affixed the, the way they were normally be affixed to the container, to the, the flat rack. So they want to mitigate the risk having less people go around when there's a, still an emergency, uh, a, a, an incident scene on, on board the ship. Thank you. Okay, Dr. McKeown. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a question of naivety, so, so please bear with me on, on slide 7 and slide 21, I think, I'll, I'll refer to as well. Um, the, if I understand it correctly, the package is put on the flat rack, and the flat rack is what is installed in the hold? Yes, that's correct. Um, is the package bolted to the flat rack? Because in slide 21, it looks as if with the fall, they've all rolled off and down towards one end. Yes, it is bolted to the flat rack. Uh, we have pictures of that. Um, apologies, we didn't include them in, in here. Um, but perhaps uh, Mr. Fai or RSB Logistic can add further detail. So did the bolts, ho did the bolts hold? Yes, it, it, it's, it has to be securely uh, uh, bolted to the flat track. As you can see on the, the top uh, picture on slide 7, you see the supporting um, things there. So the base of those supporting uh, racks are bolted onto the flat track base. So in slide 21, where you see the, um, the package, that is still bolted to the to the base of the flat rack. Yes, correctly. Okay. So just intuitively, would it not be safer and more consistent for the flat rack to be in a container? I mean, I, I just happened to be watching some containers being removed from ships the other day. I, I was on 
vacation in good sight of this. Um, they're taken a long way in the air. Um, there's a very, very rapid turnaround, and, and clearly speed is, is the whole purpose of this. Um, doesn't it add a risk just to have the flat rack bolted onto the crane? Wouldn't it be safer and more reassuring if the flat rack was in a container? Because then you've got continuity of process for the port operator. I, that, that's a naive question born of process ignorance. But Maybe I'll uh, speak and uh, shed the light on this. George Eckel, for the record. Uh, just to clarify, a flat rack basically is a shipping container, same as a sealed container. It just simply has no roof or no sides. Uh, and the reason they select a flat rack is simply for access, for loading the cylinders and things like that. But it has the identical anchor points, top and bottom, same dimensions as a closed sea container. <clears throat> if that answers your question. Thank you. And presumably, any time a flat rack is loaded, it would always be in the hold. It wouldn't be above the level of the deck. That is correct. Thank you. Monsieur Ray? I had a question. I don't know if you <laughs> just answered, uh, just asked that question uh, at the end. But uh, my question was, uh, is there any, any uh, indication where to place the flat rack in the boat? It has to go in the hold, or it could be place on the deck anywhere uh, on the boat? I think we just got the answer that it is in the hall. That's what they say. Uh, is it an obligation? To, to there is no requirement in our regulations to, to that effect, but perhaps uh, the licensee can, can provide information. Mm -hmm. RSB? Yes, they are, or George Eckel for the record, they are always in the hold. Uh, it's a commitment from the ship lines to do that. And you can, <clears throat> and you can have uh, two or three uh, flat racks, uh, one over the other? Typically there is separation uh, between these flat racks or containers um, of other cargoes in between each one. They're not typically put together. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Uh, you did say you're going to do a kind of a lesson learn report on all of this, so we look forward to reading that. Um, the good news was that uh, there was no leak and there was no breach. Um, but what the concern is, you know, we always like to ask the what if question. Uh, if there were, uh, what would we expect a different behavior here? So we look forward to reading this. Thank you. I'd like to take a, a 10 minute break now. Um, and so we'll reconvene at 11 o'clock. Thank you.